Hi there, my name is Chalmer Lowe. Welcome to PyCon's 2021 Introduction to Sprinting Workshop. Uh, I've been helping lead these workshops for a number of years, as well as supporting PyCon as a chairman and or co-chairman of the annual Python Education Summit. Super glad to have you here to help start your journey in contributing to open source through work in uh, the PyCon sprints. Uh, look forward to helping you out. I'll be leading the workshop and I'll walk you through a number of things related to how one can contribute to open source projects. Hope you enjoy the workshop and I'll talk to you when it's over. The content for this Introduction to Sprinting workshop can be found at github.com slash chalmerlow slash intro to sprinting. I've got the URL on the right side of the screen. Notice there are underscores in between the words intro, to, and sprinting. Give you a sense of the types of content we're going to cover. Uh, we're going to be looking at using version control software. We're going to be looking at interacting with version control repositories. We'll cover the process of submitting patches or contributions to a project. And at the very, very end, we have a short section on setting up virtual environments that is focused predominantly on Python development. This particular workshop has been in uh, development for a number of years. Most of the contributions have actually come from uh, folks who've taken the class and have come back and tried to contribute and add additional uh, features or insight into the process. Um, you are free to use this workshop in your communities if you would like to. It can be used as a lead-in for open source sprints, much like we're doing here at PyCon. Uh, it can be used as class material for teachers. Uh, if Say you're hosting a hackathon at work, or you're in a class situation and you have a group project that you need to work on. Um, or it can be used as a resource for open source project leaders to point uh, new contributors to, so that the new contributors can learn some of the basic skills that they might need to contribute successfully to an open source project. Um, the genesis for this particular project came from <coughs> seeing how sprints sometimes played out where somebody who's new to sprinting uh, but full of passion and excitement shows up to a sprint, um, sits down to work on a project that they're, they're interested in, and then the next you know, two, three, four, five hours are kind of spent trying to learn some of the fundamentals maybe that they don't yet have a good handle on. How do they use version control tools? Or um, what does GitHub mean when it says this thing? That often takes time away from the sprint leader. Uh, they are pulled into mentoring on fundamental skills as opposed to mentoring on the nuances of their project. Many of them do kindly and freely help mentor on the fundamental skills, uh, but the thought is if we can help divorce them from that particular uh, requirement, they can potentially be a little bit more productive um, in bringing people on board to their projects. So, in the course of doing this workshop, uh, our focus will be using a version control tool such called Git and interfacing with GitHub. There's going to be a lot of hands-on uh, work that you'll be doing, installing tools, using tools, etc. You'll be creating additions and changes to an open source project. Uh, you will then be issuing pull requests to request having those changes incorporated into the project. And again, at the, v the end, we'll have a, a short session on understanding, creating, and using virtual environments. Um, this project has um, been designed so that it can be used in a teacher or instructor-led scenario, or it can be used for self-study. So all the things that typically the instructor might say are written down so that if you're doing it in self-study mode you can read through that content. There's a number of images that you will see to help kind of uh, flesh out what particular concepts are being shared in any given lesson. In terms of prerequisites, 
if you are comfortable editing plain text files on your computer, and if you know a little bit about the command line, uh, you should be just fine. If you feel like maybe the command line is not your strong suit yet, we do have a link shown here, student preparation instructions, that will point you to some resources that you can lean on to help understand um, basic command line fundamentals. Uh, mostly we're going to be using commands like cd to change from one directory to another, maybe ls on a Linux or Unix machine, or dir on a Windows machine to look at the contents of directories, etc. So not a, a great deal of command line knowledge is required. Students are not required at all to have an in-depth knowledge on programming or Python. Um, a lot of contributions are given to open source projects that don't even touch code. People will provide documentation, people will provide a user interface design, um, graphical design, etc. Um, nor will you be required to have an in-depth knowledge of any particular open source project. Um, as we go through this workshop here, I'll be highlighting some of the things that are written down on the screen. I'm going to try to avoid reading from the screen, um, but you will kind of see that I will touch on various items that are written there, and you'll be able to go back and read those at your leisure. At the bottom of every page, uh, you will see there will be a link that will take you to the next section of the workshop, and we'll go forward together uh, in sync. And with that, I'm going to click on Table of Contents. We'll go take a look at what the Table of Contents has to see in the workshop in a little more depth. You'll see near the top, Step 1, it has a course overview and some preparation steps. Those preparation steps are predominantly focused on um, how to get an instructor ready to lead one of these types of workshops if they'd like to. And if you're a student, you feel like maybe you're, you need a little bit of extra help with something, um, particularly like, say, the command line, we do have a few things in there that you might look at that might assist you to get ready. Um, by and large, we should be able to pretty much just jump straight into the environment setup. In the environment setup stage, we'll talk about installing the software you'll need, uh, setting up GitHub, and then forking a repository that you want to work on and we will look at how to set up Git on your local machine so that you're prepared to be able to do some contributions and to track your changes. In Lesson 3, we'll move on to looking at Git, and we'll talk a little bit about some Git concepts and how Git handles things and how it stores them and, and what it does with them. Uh, we will look at cloning a repository. From there, we'll talk about uh, Git workflows. Um, We'll examine how you add a change that you've created to a project, uh, how you then commit that change and prep it for being shared with someone else, um, and then how you push that out. From there, we'll move on and we'll look at some common Git operations, things like Git diff and some of the other tools that Git provides you to help you better understand what's happening behind the scenes. Uh, we will then examine how one handles branches and how you merge branches. And we'll kind of close up the Git section on how does one handle a Git merge conflict. Um, if you have a merge conflict because you're trying to edit a file that somebody else has already tried to edit in essentially the same place and Git gets confused and can't figure out how to merge the, the two sets of changes correctly, um, how do you manually go through there and, and take care of some of that? Then we'll move on to using GitHub, talk a little bit about how GitHub is used and some of the features that it brings to the table and then we'll walk you through how you take the changes you've made and that you've pushed up to your repository and submit a pull request to, say, a project owner for their consideration for inclusion into their project. And then lastly, um, it shows two links on the page here, one for setting up a Python environment and one for setting up a data science environment. Um, we will walk through setting up a data science environment. It will use Python, we'll use tools like Conda and Python, and we'll set up an environment that way. Um, the instructions for the data science setup are more complete and robust than the instructions for the Python environment, um, and I'm much more familiar with doing the data science type of setup. If someone in the audience who kind of goes through this and wants to practice some of your skills thinks, hey, I'd love to help contribute to this workshop and help clean up the setting up the Python environment bit, we'd love to have some contributions, so that might be something to aspire to. Um, with that, I'm going to jump ahead into Section 2, the Environment Setup, and we will take a look at what that entails. Um, 
we're going to be doing some software installation. We're going to be configuring some items both on your own computer and on the website, github.com. And we'll start with this next step, installing the software you'll need. Highlight how the lessons are broken out, and all of them from here on out should be broken out in roughly the same way. Um, if you're a workshop instructor, the time box will tell you about how much time you might want to expend on this particular task. And that might include the um, introduction or overview of the task, allowing students in the class to do the tasks, um, and then covering a little bit of a deeper dive afterwards. <clears throat> Each of the lessons will have a very brief overview and a summary of the objectives that we intend to meet during the lesson. And then we immediately jump into the steps for the student to do. What should they do step by step? Um, we provide enough detail, hopefully, right, so that they can do each of these particular steps. Um, we, where necessary, provide some instructions maybe to help with Windows or Mac OS or Linux, and those are typically highlighted using, you know, various iconographies and various terms. Um, <clears throat> When the students finish all of the what to do steps, uh, there'll be a green post-it note. Those green post-it notes are indicators that you might use in a face-to-face -face workshop. We typically recommend that the students put a, a green post-it note on the top of their monitor so the instructor of the workshop can look around and when they see a sea of green post-its, they know that the majority of the people in the class have finished. Then what we do is we have a section at the bottom that talks about either the big picture or the big picture and a deep dive. Um, and we recommend that if a student finishes a little bit early, they go into the big picture or the deep dive and they read a little bit more about what they have just accomplished. Um, we try to keep the steps near the top fairly lean and mean. We don't give a lot of exposition about why they're doing the thing and what the thing means. We're just like, do step A, B, and C. And then we allow the big picture or we allow the um, the deep dive to be a place where, where they can discuss that. And part of the rationale for this is that we want to, at the beginning of the time box, give the student as much time as they can to get started on those steps and try and work through those steps. Um, if a student runs into a problem, they can immediately put up a red post-it note and mentors in the room can come around and can try and troubleshoot that. And then as we start to see more and more green post-its and people seem like they've gotten complete, then the instructor can fill out the rest of the time box with some talking and some discussion about what the big picture means or the deep dive. Um, and, and this is done largely to kind of counteract what often happens in these types of tutorials where there's a long lecture and it's like, okay, you now have three minutes to finish this, go. And then the person you know, isn't able to complete it and they kind of miss out on the start of the next lecture and they don't get a chance to hear the next lecture and understand what their next steps are going to be. So let's go take a look. A lot of these things I will go through live on the screen and we will see how they play out. Also I'll do a little bit of demonstration of each of these things. Okay, so I've got a terminal here. Get out of this. Right. And so the first step is to check to see whether or not I have Git on my machine. So I'll type in Git, and if I have Git installed, um, we would see an output that looks like this. And this output is uh, the usage manual for Git and, and the types of things you can do in Git. Um, in the event that I don't have Git installed, I can go and download Git for Windows or Mac OS or Linux. Um, we have a couple of options for Mac. If you want to download a DMG, you can do that. Um, if you already have Homebrew installed and you are familiar with using Brew to install things, you can use Brew. And similarly, we show some, some instructions on uh, using uh, various tools for, for Linux. Once you've gone through the installation process, um, you can check to see things about your Git configuration by using Git config. Um, <coughs> And it walks you through when you configure a Git system, 
Uh, there are types of config file locations. We'll see global, and that'll come up again later in our instructions, etc. Um, so we've confirmed in two different ways that Git's installed. Um, if you are in a situation where you type git config and you get back a thing like command not found, um, typically what that means is you need to quit your terminal, close out of this window, right? And then reopen your terminal. Um, and the reason that happens is a lot of times when you install stuff in the terminal, um, some of the, the terminal uh, paths, et cetera, et cetera, don't up date properly and they can't recognize where the software has been installed. So if you simply close out your terminal and open it up again, it will go and reread its path variables and figure out where stuff is installed and be able to find it for you. Okay, and there's a, a link here to a page that has some details about that. Okay. From there, I'm going to go to setting up GitHub and forking a repository. So we'll do that for this session. We're going to ensure that folks are set up on GitHub, have an account, and we'll walk you through forking a repository. For those who don't know, GitHub is a web-based version control repository. Um, it's a giant internet hosting service. GitHub provides the functionality that Git provides, such as distributed version control and some source code management, but it also offers a variety of other features, things like bug tracking, um, wikis for documentation and communication, gists, the ability to issue feature requests or issues, um, task management, and more. Right now, uh, my understanding, Git is, GitHub is the world's largest repository for source code. Uh, it can be used in tandem with Git to make changes and to share those changes. Uh, it can be used to help deal with conflicts and enable pro project participants, right, to help synchronize all the things they're doing. So in this session, <coughs> we're going to understand why GitHub is used to support these open source projects and we're going to use a couple of the basic features of GitHub. We're going to prepare for contributing to a project, in creating, including creating a copy of that project. And those copies are called forks. In a later session, we're going to get into more detail about the features and capabilities of GitHub, and we're going to discuss some additional steps in the open source process, such as issuing a pull request. So what we want folks to do, they'll go in, they'll either log in or create an account if they already have a GitHub account. Uh, just go ahead and log into your existing account if that's the one you want to use. Uh, if you don't have a GitHub account, you'll have to, to go make one. Um, we give you a link to take you to the GitHub account creation page. When you get there, there's going to be some fields for usernames and for your email address and to enter a password that you want to use. Um, and then from there, once your account is, is active, uh, we'll have you go to this particular project. There's a link to it. It's called the Codeless Project. I'll show it to you in a second. And we'll walk you through creating a fork of that project. So let's go take a look at it. This is the Intro to Sprinting Codeless Project. Uh, just a quick overview, right? We see that there's about eight or nine different files. Uh, there's a README file, and we can see the content of it at the bottom of the screen. Um, there's some various pieces of text, etc. And there's Annabelle Lee, there's Beowulf, um, Do Not Go Gentle Into the Night, uh, Jabberwocky. There's also this lesson. It's called the Conflict Lesson. Um, that will come into play later when we do uh, merging and um, the merging or dealing with merge conflicts. But for now, what we want to have you do is go over and click on the fork button. And when you click on the fork button, that will create a new copy for you of all of this poetry, etc., this whole repository. Right? So if you click that button, uh, what you will see will be a copy of the repository in your own GitHub project area. And so this particular user, sig Sevneo has already done this. And you will notice that at the bottom, there'll be a little tiny link, and it'll tell you where you got that repository from, in case you forget, right? So it uh, maintains a tie to the original location for the repository. All right. Um, give you a little bit of the big picture on project files in GitHub, etc. They are called repositories. Some people will refer to them as repos. Um, for every 
project that you have, uh, you may actually have several kind of versions of the repository or versions of the repo. Um, one repo that we often refer to is the original project repository. Uh, sometimes we use the term upstream repository to refer to that. And the repository might have some folders and some files. When you do a fork, this upstream repository gets copied. And if your name were Johnny Appleseed, you would have a copy of the upstream repository. Um, we tend to refer to your own copy as the origin repository in this lesson. Right? So upstream would be the original project that uh, you know, you're trying to support. The forked version is an origin repository. Uh, and we'll use that term later in some, some git commands. And so if you need to make a change or get some communicate with your repository, you call it origin. If you want to communicate with the main project repository, you call it upstream. All right. A nuance or two about your GitHub copy, it is exactly that. It's your copy. You can do whatever you want to your copy. You can change it to suit your needs. Um, within limits maybe of copyright or the license on the project, etc. And you do not necessarily have to explicitly share any of your changes back to the original author. Again, subject to certain license requirements, but those are outside the scope of this conversation. Um, behind the scenes, though, GitHub is going to maintain a link for you so that if you choose to share your changes, you can do that. Um, and unless people go looking, no one at the original repository is generally even going to notice or care about any specific details of your changes until you tell them about it. Um, just a caveat, right? For them to find your changes may not necessarily be hard. There is a record kept of who has forked all of the, the changes to the repository, etc. But there's generally no reason for folks to go looking. So you can experiment, play around, etc. And you don't necessarily have to worry about people like looming over your shoulder and like wondering what you're doing or why. So from here, I'm going to click down on this link, setting up Git, and we're going to talk about Git. Get Git ready for use. Um, typically, when you're contributing to a project, you know you want to have your name associated with your contributions, and Git will automatically attach your e-name and email address to every commit that you make if you tell it how. So what we'll have you do is run the following commands, git config tech tech global or hyphen hyphen global user dot name and then you put your name. Uh, we will also then have you do the same thing using git config tech tech global user dot email and put your email address. And what this will do is it'll set things up for you. So git will then start to attribute those two uh, data points to all the commits that you need and that you issue. Um, kind of walk you through the big picture just a little bit, right? There are other configurations that you can make for Git. Uh, they're a little bit outside the scope of this particular workshop. Um, using the global option applies all these settings to all the Git projects on your machine. You're only going to have to need to run this once per computer. Um, if you want to change a setting, maybe you change an email address, uh, you can simply rerun the command and overwrite the previous settings. Uh, if you have a very specific project that has um, <clears throat> particular settings, like maybe a project is being done for work and a different project is being done you know, as a, as a personal hobby, uh, you can run the command while inside of a particular project directory and just leave off the global option and it'll set a local configuration that's related to just that project. Um, later sections, we're going to go into a little bit more depth on using Git. Right. Uh, if you want to learn a little bit more about setting up Git, we do have some resources at the bottom of the page for you. All right, with that, I'm going to jump ahead now to the next section, and we'll talk a little bit about using Git to do various things version control software enables you to control various versions of your projects. Um, it is really good for helping you with managing your own projects, and I highly recommend that folks do that. It essentially allows you to keep track of all the changes in one of your projects, especially if you need to roll back to an earlier version or something. Um, but it also makes it really easy to contribute to projects that other people are working on. Um, 
if you're collaborating on a project and you have um, copy your project hosted somewhere like GitHub, your code will reside in a remote repository. Typically, we call the, that repository upstream. Um, programmers can then copy a fork of the project into their own remote repository and then clone the fork to a local repository on their desktop, for example. And they get to work on adding features. They get to squash bugs. When they're finished, they can push their code back up to their fork, and they can issue that pull request to the upstream repository so that other folks can then see their code and or incorporate it. Uh, in this lesson, we're going to understand a little bit more about why Git's used in open source. Uh, we will use a few basic Git commands to help us get a copy of an open source project, um, to save some modifications and some additions and deletions to the project, to submit those changes to the project, uh, to incorporate other changes to the project, um, verify the status of their repository, and perform some basic troubleshooting. This is going to be hands-on. Uh, the Git software is incredibly powerful, and our goal is just to get you started with it, but it's going to take some time and it's going to take some practice on your own to make you into an expert at using Git. Um, we end up using Git from the command line in this course. There's going to be a lot of commands that could be used. Sometimes they might feel a little confusing. That's okay. Uh, it'll start to make sense once you do it a few times, and you know that's why you're here. Uh, if using it on the command line is something that you're not super comfortable with, there are graphical user interface tools available as well, but they're outside the scope of this workshop. Um, GitK, SourceTree, and many others are available. We'll leave it up to you to find maybe a graphical user interface that you like. Um, there are about five lessons we'll go through, and we're going to start with looking at Git concepts. About Git. We're going to talk a little bit about Git concepts and kind of what's happening behind the scenes. Um, a Git repository at first glance might seem very sophisticated, but at the lowest level, I like to feel that they're reasonably simple. Git will track changes to files and they'll store details about those changes in a special database and they'll categorize those, those files um, to help take it through the modification process or the, the tracking process. As we look at the process that Git uses to track and process these changes, um, I like to imagine that we're processing materials in a warehouse and shipping them to another warehouse location. So for our purposes, we're going to compare each part of the process to this warehouse analogy that you see on the screen, content that's in your local directory, your local folder. We're going to consider that to be in a local warehouse. Um, when we categorize things as being in the staging area, we can consider that as though the object has been placed on a pallet. And when we do a commit action using git, we can imagine that we've picked up the entire pallet with all of the stuff that we've put on it and put it into a truck. And things that are sent to remote, we can imagine those have been shipped using the truck to a remote warehouse. Um, in our case, that will often be called origin. Now this analogy is an analogy that I'm borrowing from Jessica Kerr. Uh, she gave a great talk on this subject. We've included a link to it so you can go and watch her talk. She dives into more depth than what I did here. Um, for this particular lesson, there's going to be a lot of conversation about these concepts, uh, so there's no real hands-on steps here. You can feel free to, to read through these following sections. I'm going to highlight some of the, the details. Um, so first off, we'll talk about the local directory, right? This is the directory or the folder that's on your computer. It's going to have all of your files. It's going to have all of your drafts, your completed work, your incomplete work. It might have some tools or utilities that you've made. And all that material is uniquely yours. Right? Um, if we imagine this kind of warehouse scenario in your local folder, there's going to be things that you want to sell, if you will, or push out to others. Those would be project files. There's going to be some things that you might be storing in your repository that's just needed to help you do your job. Maybe you have a script that helps clean up um, files that have been made during testing, or maybe you auto-generate some content and you use that content for yourself, but you don't need anybody else to have a copy of that auto-generating script, etc. Um, you might have configurations that are related to your compilation environment. And then there's stuff in your local folders that is still needs to be worked on, still need to be processed. Right? 
local directories are often produced using the command git clone and they are generally based on a remote repository but you can go the other way you can start with a local repository um, and then you can push it up to github etc but for our situation since we're working on an open source project we will typically git clone um, that content in some way and we'll talk in more detail about how that works all right so in our case this is this computer here is our local computer uh, we are Johnny Appleseed, and we've got several projects. We have the Space Game and Project Alpha and a project called MyTest. Within Git nomenclature, there's a, a, an area that, or a, a categorization they refer to as your staging area. That holds all the files that are ready to be added to the project and eventually shared with others. Um, and so we can imagine, right, having a bunch of boxes that we want to load up onto a pallet so we could eventually put it onto a truck. Everything that is what we'll call complete and ready to be loaded on the truck gets put on that pallet. We'll use the git add command, and we'll show how all this works later, to stage the files that we care about. So we might have a file in folder 1, and we might have several files in folder 3, and we use git add to stage those. They're still here on our local computer. Uh, we have not yet made it available to anybody on these internet uh, computers at our origin repository or our upstream repository. I do want to make a note here that once you add a file to the staging area, um, the staging area will maintain references to that version of the file. It takes essentially a snapshot. If you're like, oh crud, I forgot to add something else. Let me go add one more feature to the, to the file. The staging area will not recognize that that new bit has been added to the file. It has a snapshot of what was there when you ran git add, and it doesn't recognize the new changes. But if you want to get those changes onto the palette, all you do is run git add a second time, and git will take a snapshot of the newer version of the file and capture those newest changes. The commit area within git is the area that holds all the changes that you're going to release to a remote warehouse. Um, we can compare that again to being the truck, right? We've got our pallet, pallet is loaded, we put the pallet on the truck. To do that, we type git commit, and we'll walk you through what that type of command will look like and some of the nuances. Um, just a, a note, much like we saw with staging, if you add a file to the commit area, and then you make more additional changes to the file, Git won't recognize that and won't store those new changes um, in the truck. You will have to run a git add to take your new changes and get those staged, and then you'll have to do a git commit to get those staged changes added to your truck. All right. All right. Uh, next area, essentially, kind of within uh, GitHub's categorizations of how it's handling files, is this idea of the remote repository. And this is just any repository other than the local one on your local computer. Um, <clears throat> these repositories can be stored elsewhere, like on another server in your, in your workplace. It can be stored in a place like GitHub or Bitbucket or GitLab. Remotes are named. The default name for the remote that you use git clone to get is typically called origin. Um, another remote name that we've mentioned and you'll hear more about is other people's projects and those are typically referred to as upstream. Once you have your stuff loaded in the truck and you need to get it delivered out to a remote repository, you can use the git push command. And that'll push a copy of those changes via the truck to the remote repository. Uh, and notice in this case, Everything in folder 1, now there's a separate copy of it in folder 1 in my origin repository. Everything that was in folder 3, there's another copy of that uh, up in my origin repository. Now, up to now, we haven't yet reached a point where we are notifying the upstream repository that there are changes. So these two sets of changes are only present in two places, and these are both places that we essentially control, our local computer and our GitHub uh, project area. We'll cover more about how to get things to the upstream project later. Uh, if you want to have some more information about how some of these concepts work, 
We've got a pretty good list of both tutorials and reference documents and books, etc. Uh, ProGit is free. It's a good online resource. It's available in PDF as well. A um, lot of good content there. So with the idea in our heads that we have a staging area, we have um, we, with the local repository, the staging area, we have git commits and remotes, we're going to start talking about how do we actually get each of these things set up and how do we use them appropriately. And we're going to start that journey by looking at cloning a repository. This next section walks through cloning a repository taking a repository that we have forked and getting a copy of the fork down onto our local computers. Uh, we want to start off by kind of practicing the mechanics of making changes and propagating those changes back to the owner, but we want to minimize your fear or worry potentially of breaking anything, and we want to avoid, in this case, having to figure out the nuances of somebody else's code. So as I kind of mentioned earlier, we're using a project that has nothing but poetry in it. So we can change these things without fear. We don't have to worry about what is the code doing, etc. We're going to have you go through and create a folder called my test. Um, we're going to use the git clone command to clone a repository down toward our local computer. We're going to move into that repository and we're going to get that repository set up so that it can refer to the original upstream remote. All right, so let's do that. I'll demonstrate this, right? Uh, make dir <coughs> is a command on the command line, allows you to create or make directories. I'm going to use cd to change into that directory. Okay. Um, I'm going to use the git clone command. Now, in the lesson, we show this as though you were Johnny Appleseed, but what you really need to do is get the URL for the repository you're trying to clone. And so you can go to the repository you care about, and in this case, uh, I have created a repository. It's called Intro to Sprinting Codeless Project. Um, I'm not forking this from, from anybody else, so in this case, I'm actually going to be getting right to this project and not to a fork of somebody else's project. Uh, so bear with us. In your case, you would want to be going to your own repository projects um, and getting your fork of intro to CODIS. All right, so I'm going to copy this URL. Click. And paste that here. And let's go back to our lesson material. We'll hit enter. And we see that it's cloning it into a new folder. Um, it's looking through a series of objects that are there. Um, it's receiving those objects, essentially downloading them, and resolving any potential changes, etc. And then it tells us that it's done. If I use ls to see what's listed in this folder, if you were on Windows, you might use dir. Um, we see that there's a folder within my test. So I'm going to change directories and go into intro to sprinkling codeless project. Uh, I'm going to use ls to see what the contents of this folder are, and now we see that there's a variety of these uh, files that have different poems and such in them. My next step is to add a reference for git to know where the upstream is. Um, in Johnny Appleseed's case, Johnny Appleseed is getting a copy from his own project folder, and he wants to refer to mine because mine is the upstream. Uh, in this case, you would do something like git remote, add upstream, and you would use the URL for the upstream repository. In this case, my upstream and my fork are essentially all the same, so meh. Okay. Now, setting the upstream is something you only have to do a single time for each of the projects that you work on. Uh, and once it's set, it's set for good. So to give you a sense of kind of what's happening here, before we can actually start adding to a project, we have to get a clone of that. Um, and so 
git clone takes a copy of all these folders and puts them down into your computer in the master or the main folder called my test. Um, if you want to know what remotes are currently registered for your git project, you can type git remote hyphen v and it'll tell you a little bit about the remotes that are present. Git remote hyphen v. Okay. Uh, I'm going to change the size of the font here a little bit so it goes down on a single line. You'll see that I've got a uh, set of URLs registered as origin and a set of URLs registered as upstream. Right. In my case, they happen to be the same. In your case, they would be different. So let's take a look at what that would look like. Um, and so on your computer, you know, if you were Johnny Appleseed, your origin would be pointing toward your uh, project folders on GitHub, and the upstream would be pointing toward, say, mine. Okay. Again, just a reminder, you only have to do this once. Right. Okay. So with that, we're going to move on, and we're going to take a look at some of the main tasks you do, adding changes uh, to the staging area, committing those changes, and then pushing those changes out. About <clears throat> adding, committing, pushing, we'll also use the git status command to get a better understanding of where we are in our process and what kind of our next steps might be. This is going to presume that you've made it through all the steps up to this point and that you have forked the codeless project to your project area in GitHub, um, that you have cloned that codeless project down to your local MyTest directory, and that you are currently in the intro to sprinting codeless project on your command line. And so I meet those criteria. Um, again, we can look at the files that are present using ls on Mac or Linux, maybe using dir if you're on Windows. Because I have cloned down a git repository, there are some files that are hidden. I'm going to use lsal to do to expose some of those to our view. I don't recall what the exact command is on Windows to do the same. But you'll see that there is a .git folder here. Um, that .git folder holds all the metadata and all the other things that Git uses to keep track of status of different files, etc. We're not going to go into there. We're not going to muck around in that. Um, and discussing some of the depth of what's contained in there is beyond the scope of this class. Just be aware that it is there. You don't want to change it, delete it, or modify it. Okay. Because this is a Git repository, we can use the git status command to help us understand the current state of the repository. First thing we see is that it tells us that we are on the main branch of our repository and that our current branch is up to date with the main branch at our origin. We also see a note that says there's nothing to commit um, and that our working tree is clean. So we've made no changes to the repository at this point. make this a little bit bigger. All right. So the next thing we're going to do is we're going to take one of these files and we're going to go ahead and edit it. Make a change. doesn't really matter. Um, let's start with, say, the walrus and the carpenter. So I'm going to use VI. You can use whatever text editor you want. And I will open this up. I'm going to make some changes. The walrus and the carpenter is written by Lewis Carroll, the great author. The super great author? Yeah, what the heck, right? Okay. We'll save that change. Okay. So all I've done is made one minor edit, changed a single line in a file. Let's find out using git status what git thinks about this process and thinks about where we're at. You notice it kind of repeats what it said before. It says, hey, we're on the main branch and our branch is up to date with the uh, main <clears throat> branch at the origin. Nothing we have done locally has been what we'll call recorded for posterity's sake by Git. So it still feels like we are um, at the same point as the main 
branch at the origin. But it does give us a hint. It says, hey, you've made some changes. I can tell you've made changes, but you haven't told me what to do with them. You haven't asked me to stage them for you or to commit them or anything else. And so it will highlight any files we might have modified, and we've only done one so far. Um, it does provide us with a couple of useful tips if you want to stage something so it can be committed use git add. If you just want to get rid of all of the changes that we made, maybe we made a mistake in editing the walrus and the carpenter, we can use git restore and the name of the file to just get rid of those changes. In our case, we want to git add, and we'll git add the walrus and the carpenter. There we go. If I had more than one file and I wanted to uh, add multiple files, it is possible to Put the file names down and separate them by a space um, and do multiple file names at the same time. But now that I've added a file, let's use git status again and get a sense of where are we now in the project. Notice previously it showed modified um, in red and it told us that it was not staged for commit. Now it tells us that we have a few changes that are ready to be committed and it shows them as being modified and it shows them as green. Uh, it again gives kind of a, a hint like, hey, if you don't want to keep this and get it committed, you can essentially get rid of it using that same git restore command, but in this case you'll use the tac tac staged to tell it to get rid of staged files, uh, to unstage them. All right. So let's commit our changes, and we'll use the git commit command. We use hyphen m, this flag tells the commit command that we're going to provide it a message. And typically we want to keep our messages fairly short, fairly uh, succinct, and to let people know, ourselves included, what this change is all about. Um, so if I do this commit, it will update details about the author. Git then tells us that it has updated the main branch. It spits out the subject line that we provided, and it lets us know the breadth of the changes that we've created. In this case, one file was changed. We inserted, quote unquote, a new line. We deleted a line, and that's how it considers it. Even though the change all happened on a single line, it's as though we just deleted the old line and put a brand new line with a few extra characters in it. All right. So now that we've done a git commit, let's take a look at what git thinks about all this and say git status. It again reminds us that we're on the main branch, but now it says, hey, since you've done a commit, you're actually a little bit ahead of what's stored in the origin repository in the main branch, and you're ahead by a whole commit. Gives us a nice helpful hint that we can use git push to publish those local commits. It also reminds us that at this point, we don't have any other changes. There's nothing left to commit, and our working tree is essentially clean. All right. So if I want to push those changes, I can say git push origin main, and this will take my main branch and push it, a copy of it, up to the origin repository. Notice it roots through and it identifies there's five objects. Um, it counts them, it does, does some compression in various ways, saves some bandwidth in sending the data up, and it's going to write this information up to GitHub. When it's done, it gives us a reminder of where to go to look, gives us the URL, it gives us some hashes, we'll talk about hashes at a later time, and it says it wrote the main branch to the main branch. Okay, let's do git status again. And we see that it says, hey, now that we have pushed that information up to origin and main, the branch is up to date with origin and main. Okay. Now, because I control and I own um, origin, and in your case, you would also control origin because that's where you've forked your data, um, the push basically gets automatically written to your account and everything works out fine. Okay. Let's go take a quick look and see what's happened. Okay. Uh, mm -hmm. 
If I go look at the file, The Walrus and the Carpenter, we see that there's a little note here. It says that uh, details about the author have been updated, and that happened three minutes ago. So let's go check that file, take a look, and it says Lewis Carroll, the super great author. All right. And so that's how you get content up to your fork of a project. <clears throat> and that's how you use Git status to help you better understand where things are. Um, I find it really helpful that Git, provi Git status provides you know these little hints and tips to remind me of what to do next. Um, you should get in the habit of reading the responses that you get from Git. They typically have meaningful information. Sometimes as a newbie I have felt like it was a little bit overwhelming. There's a lot of stuff. I didn't understand some of the terminology and I'm going to be totally honest. To this day, there's various things in there that I see them, and I still don't know what they mean. Um, but it hasn't impacted my ability to contribute to open source projects, right? Right, and you'll learn more, and I will learn more as we go through. Uh, I'm not going to repeat all of this. Many of the things we said are down in the deep dive, so you can go back and reread all this if you missed something. Um, from there. I want to take us to the next lesson, which talks about some additional common operations that you'll use in Git. We'll talk about uh, checking to see what kind of changes have been made in a file. And we will talk about um, how to restore a modified file to its original state. For the purpose of this, we're going to dive into the git diff command. We'll talk about the outputs that you get from it and how they can help you. We're going to use a text editor to open the beowulf.txt file. Um, and We're just going to change one letter on the first line. We're going to save the file and then we will look at the changes that we've made. So I'm going to use vi to do this. I'm going to change the first letter from a capital letter to a lowercase letter and save my results. We use git diff to see what happens. All right, so it spit out a lot of information. Some of it is in, at least on my screen, red and green, right? Um, there's lots of text, various things there. So let's walk through each of these things item by item. Uh, it tells us that we are using git diff, and it tells us that we have a file, um, and it refers to it as the A file. And then it says, hey, we have a second file called B. Um, it tells us the names of each of those files. Uh, in some cases, you may have two files that are named with two different names, and you might use git diff to compare the two files to see which one has which changes. In this case, it is not necessarily looking at two different files per se. It's looking at the same file, but it's looking at two different versions of it. So it's just telling us that version A and version B. All right. And it tells us that um, <clears throat> version A is marked with a minus sign in further references below, and version B is marked with plus signs. Uh, <clears throat> and so this one tells us that in version A, it will show us lines 1 to 4, and in version B, it will show us lines 1 to 4. And so it gives us uh, a starting line and some certain amount of context around that line, either before or after in some cases. Uh, and so in this case, this first line comes from file A. It has been deleted, which is what this minus sign here is indicative of. Uh, this comes from file B, and it has been added, which is what uh, is indicated by this plus sign. Um, notice the original version had the lowercase or the uppercase B, and the new version has the lowercase B. Okay, you might wonder what all of this mess is since we didn't necessarily make these changes down here. Um, I was a bit surprised to see this show up, so I had to do a little research and determine that uh, the text editor that I like to use, VI, tends to include a new line character at the end of a file. Uh, that is being uh, edited as text as opposed to edited as binary files. Um, so VI was kind enough to throw in a new line character at the end of the file. And so this original line, which is the last one, did not have a new line character. Uh, so that got deleted. It added a new line character to that text. And so now this diff shows up. Um, <coughs> and it's showing us that, hey, starting at line 3184, and showing four lines of context, 
right. We'll talk a little bit more about how diff does things, and we'll give some different examples. But that's basically what we saw. Uh, I don't want to keep these changes, so I'm going to use this command, git checkout, hyphen, hyphen, Beowulf, and it will get rid of that change for me. And by doing git status, we see that there are no uh, tracked or untracked changes in our repository. So let's do a little bit of a deep dive and talk a little bit more about what git's doing um, with a little bit less of the kerfuffle of the new line thing at the end. Uh, so here again, we have file A, file B, um, and it tells us that starting on line 10, and it's going to show us three lines <coughs> out of the original file. Starting on line 10, it'll show us four lines out of the new file. And in this case, I simply took a file and I added a new line to it. I added a line at the end of it called line 13. If, however, I go into a file and I uh, remove a line but don't add anything new, what you would probably see is something that looks a little bit more like this. And it shows, hey, starting at line 9 in the original file, I'm going to give you five lines of context. And starting at line 9 on the second file, I'll give you four lines of context. And it shows me these are all the unchanged lines. Line 12 got deleted line 13 remains so uh, similarly if I have a line that gets changed we might see something like what we saw with Beowulf where line 11 got deleted and it got replaced with this new line where the word 11 is typed out instead of using numerals okay. and lastly if I have multiple changes in a given file much like we saw a few minutes ago it might show places where hey something got deleted and something got added Something got deleted, something got added. So those are some tools that will help you better understand uh, how one file might change from or look different from another file so you can really pinpoint uh, what changes you might see. And you'll see something similar to this where they have uh, deleted files and added files or deleted lines and added lines. You'll see something similar to this on GitHub when you go compare changes between one file and another file. Um, so you'll see this kind of diff output elsewhere. All right. With that, we're going to go take a look at using Git to create branches and to merge branches together. In terms of branching and merging, uh, with a lot of large projects, it's very common to create a variety of branches and then merge those branches together, uh, potentially with the project's main branch when you finalize your changes. Uh, you will have seen some references to main in some of our earlier lessons. Um, main is the default branch. Um, you might also see primary default branches referred to as master in some legacy projects. Um, a number of folks in the open source community have begun migrating uh, their terminology for their default branches from using the term master to using the term main or something similar. <coughs> our projects we use main. Uh, as you're Going forward and doing some work, a typical enhancement that you might be doing might follow the following path, right? You create a branch, and that branch is a mechanism whereby Git allows you to essentially to have this separate workspace to work in. Um, you'll use a command called git checkout, and we'll talk about the nuances of that. Um, you'll do your work as a series of git add and git commit cycles. You're going to merge your changes with the main branch, and then you'll push your content up to your origin repository and submit a pull request to the upstream repository. Uh, the details of pull requests will be covered in a different discussion. Um, when you're doing uh, this type of development, you, know, you might create a new feature, you might fix a bug, you might experiment with some changes to the code. A bit about branching philosophy, branches should be small. They should be self-contained so that they can be easily merged. Um, I will say that um, sprawling and convoluted changes to code can make it nearly impossible to merge changes. It also presents a significant burden to the project maintainer. It's difficult for them to figure out what it is you're trying to achieve. It's difficult for them to figure out if there's going to be any significant conflicts from what you're pushing and what's happening in other feature branches that might be under development right then and there. Um, so as you're looking at creating branches, 
Uh, it is customary for branches to be focused on very specific problems, one bug fix for branch, maybe one new feature for branch. So don't sit down and try and do like 12 bug fixes and put them all into one branch and then submit it and have, you know, dozens or hundreds of changes in files throughout the structure and expect that it'll be incorporated. In terms of what we're going to do, we're going to go create a new branch, we're going to do some work, and then we're going to figure out how to get that merged into or get main merged into your branch to ensure that you've minimized the number of potential conflicts. All right. We're going to check out a brand new branch using tack B. We'll call it apple seed feature. Now we will edit one of the files. Okay. Put add just a little bit to the beginning. All right. Now we need to add those changes to the staging area. We're going to commit those changes. From there, <clears throat> I'm going to check out the main branch and look to see if the project maintainer has provided any additional updates to the main branch. Maybe there's something new, and I want to make sure that I'm not conflicting with some of the new features that have been added to the main branch. So we will now do a git pull from the upstream main branch. Okay. Uh, there were no changes in this case. Everything was already up to date. If, for example, I felt like there might also be some changes in my own repository in Origin, someone else had been working with me on something, we might also pull from Origin, but generally that's not really going to be a problem. You typically just need to figure out if the upstream maintainer has added anything new that you want to check for conflicts. All right. So let's go back and check out our Appleseed feature. And now let's use git to merge our changes and the, any changes that might have been found in main together. All right. Okay. With that done, we can push to our origin repository. And we're going to give it the name of the branch so that it is captured at the origin repository as a separate branch. Um, that we can then refer to. Push. From here we see that Git attempts to reach out to GitHub. Um, it has five pieces of information that it wants to send, including my changes. Uh, it does some compression. It tries to write some of those objects across the internet. Um, gives us this handy reminder hey, now you should go over here and you should use issue a pull request for this feature on GitHub by visiting this particular URL. And so if we were to go to click on this URL, we'd be able to see there's an opportunity for us to issue a pull request, and we'll, we'll get to that bit in a little bit. All right. So let's talk a little bit more about kind of the big picture here. So let's imagine that work on a project has got multiple commits to the to the main branch, um, and you want to add a, a bug fix related to issue 53. And a lot of this is discussed in the book linked here. Right? Um, as various commits are added to the process, commit 1, commit 2, um, maybe we take at commit 2, we make the decision to create a branch to work on issue 53. And we add a couple commits, commit C3 and C5. Um, meanwhile, somebody else is making a change, and they've added a commit C4. And now we want to merge all those things together and create a new merged version um, at commit C6. Having these branches allows more than one person to work essentially in isolation and change some things, add some things, test their results to make sure that they appear to be correct. Eh and then merge everything back together. Also having you know, a primary branch 
that has little to no changes on it or very uh, carefully crafted changes to it allows you to have a clean and reliable and working set of code essentially at all times. To give you a little bit more depth on what makes a good branch name or are there rules for branch names, we have a sequence of uh, specifications highlighted here. You can't have two consecutive dots anywhere in the branch name. You can't have things like uh, backslashes in it can't start with or end with a forward slash. At signs are uh, not allowed. Other signs like question marks or asterisks, etc. Right. If you want to know a bit more about Git branching, we have some resources that are available to you. Um, and with that, let's go take a look at what happens if you create a branch and you go to merge and there is some form of conflict. I'm you're working with a group of folks and potentially working on the same set of files, etc. You're going to have conflicts as folks try to edit the same locations within particular files or same files in general. Git is designed to help us to accommodate for that. Um, and help us resolve what are, what are called merge conflicts. <clears throat> In order for us to generate two copies, essentially, of the same file with different changes in them so that we can walk through the process of resolving a merge conflict, we're actually going to edit a file up on GitHub, and then we're going to edit a file, the same file, and in the same location uh, within the file, on our local repository, and then we're going to try and merge those two files together, and we'll see what happens. So with that in mind, we have a little warning here. Uh, you know, in the next few steps, some of the things that we will ask you to do will be done on GitHub, and then some of the things we ask you to do will be done in the terminal. So the first thing that I'll do is I'm going to go to uh, the Intro to Sprinting Codeless project, and I will find the conflict lesson file. I'm going to click on the pencil sign to allow me to edit the file directly through the, the web page. Um, I'm going to add a letter, probably an A, something like that. Um, I will then attempt to save those changes. Uh, you'll see that when you do the commit changes process, it provides you a place to put a little bit of a subject line to describe what you did and then an optional extended description for my purposes I'm just going to leave them blank uh, and from there I'll come back and I'll do some work in the terminal and we'll talk about that in a second so let's go and <clears throat> find the conflict lesson txt I'll click on the pencil I go in I'll put the letter a I'll scroll down I'm just going to leave these blank and hit commit changes Okay, and so now we see that the file on GitHub has an A in it. All right, let's make a similar change, but let's do it on our local repository. So for this purpose, I want to check out a brand new branch, and I'm going to use tack B to indicate that it is a new branch. I'm going to call it conflict merge. Okay. From there, I'm going to open the lesson file. I'm going to add a B to the end of this. All right. <clears throat> I need to do git add. I need to do git commit. And we'll say something like, you know, adds minor edit for merge conflict testing. Doop. Okay. All right. I'm going to check out main on my local computer. I'm going to request uh, any changes that it might be hosted up on GitHub. Git pull origin main. Okay, And we see that, sure enough, as it's pulling down some changes from GitHub, it appears as though there have been some changes made to conflict lesson. Okay. So I'm going to go back and check out my conflict merge branch and I'm going to get merge 
main into my conflict merge branch, and we'll see what happens. All right. So Git tells us that it's trying to do an auto merge. Uh, it then warns us that it had a conflict, and it tells us which file or files those conflicts might have occurred in, and we see that it occurred in conflict lesson, which we expect. Um, it then tells us, hey, the automatic merge failed, and it gives us this helpful reminder. Go in, fix the conflicts, and then commit the result. So let's take a look. I'm going to use VI to go in and look at the local version again. But in the local version, since we tried to merge what was in the main branch into the conflict branch, uh, we see that GitHub has gone and edited the file. And it has actually included both versions of the text within this file. And it has put in some separator lines to indicate which text came from which file. So we see a series of chevrons and the word head. We see a line with text on it. Um, that was in conflict. We see a separator which is made out of equal signs. We see another line that looks nearly identical. It is the other line that it had the conflict with. It's like, I don't know if you want an A or a B. And then it has a line with chevrons and the word main. So everything from the equal sign up to the word head is indicative of changes that were associated with the head branch. And head is an, an alias for the current branch that we have checked out. Everything from the equal sign down is indicative. These are all the changes that we found in the main branch. And so based on this, I can look at these two versions and I can make a decision about which one I want to keep. And so I go in, I'll get rid of the version that has the A's in it because I want to keep my local version. Uh, I have to get rid of the text that Git has added to this. So I'll get rid of this chevron with head and the equal sign and the chevron with main. Now I'm going to save this just like any other file and we're going to go through and do git add. <clears throat> okay, We'll do git commit. Um, okay, all right. And from there I can push this new clean and revised version up to origin and we will tell it that this branch is a new branch that should be hosted up on origin as well. So what just happened? <coughs> well, turns out up on the codeless project since I've done this like three or four times now trying to make edits, I have forgotten that I failed to delete the conflict merge branch. And now it's trying to take what I was just sending it and putting it up on the interwebs. So I'm just going to make that go away. I'm going to try and send it. And this time, since conflict merge is not already up on the interwebs, hopefully everything will work fine. Yay. All right. And again, it's got this kind of sequence of, of things that tell us, hey, we had a number of objects we wanted to send, and we compressed them. And then, handy reminder, go create a pull request for that branch by going to this particular website. Okay. <clears throat> and so if I go up here, uh, I can now check, view all the branches, and we'll see that we have a brand new conflict merge branch. Uh, we can go look at that one and said, hey, check it out. Uh, recently, there were some pushes. Uh, somebody sent something up, and I can do a comparison and do a pull request, and we'll talk about that in a minute. Cool. OK. A <clears throat> uh, couple of nuances here. Pull this down. If you were to have done a git status, you will see that it will tell you a little bit about what happens once a merge conflict occurs. Um, so if I type git status, it'll say, hey, you have some unmerged paths. Um, basically means you have some unmerged files. Again, it has a handy reminder. Go ahead and fix the commits and run, or fix the conflicts and go run git commit. Or if you realize belatedly, like, you really don't want this merge to happen, you can just use git merge abort, 
and it will revert the merge attempt. Um, once you have fixed the conflictions in the files, it also reminds you that to take care of the fact that it's got these unmerged paths, do that git add as part of marking the resolution and then run the commit to save the resolution that you've done. All right, let's see. That's it. So from there, we're going to go and look at using GitHub to kind of take us through to the next step. More about the GitHub user interface, we'll talk about issuing pull requests, um, and there's a little bit of mention of things like GitHub Flow, which is a, a branch-based workflow. So let's get started. We'll go and look at GitHub Concepts capabilities available in GitHub. We'll take a look at a few of those things that are available to you. Um, if you navigate to your GitHub repository for the Codeless project, um, and in this case we want to make sure that you're looking at your own version of the repo, not uh, my version, um, you should see that there's a number of tabs across the top. You may have things like code or issues, pull requests, projects, wiki, etc. And so a series of just general tabs. If you click on the Issues tab, you might find a list of issues. Um, and if you don't see that tab, there is a note below that might help you to set it up so that your system is ready or your repository is ready to track issues. Um, you can enable the Issues tab by navigating to your project. Right. Going to have folks take a look at you know some of these issues that are here. Some of the issues are not enabled by default. Uh, maybe somebody should add a file for jokes. And we see that you know somebody made this suggestion. It was added at some point in the past. Um, <clears throat> colleague of mine, Seawolf, he added a commit that referenced that issue, et cetera, et cetera. And so there's mechanisms to add ideas or suggestions for how the project ought to evolve and then for people to have some discussions on that matter. All right. Okay. Doo -doo -doo. We also want you to look at the upstream version and take a look at how the upstream repository might differ from a little bit from your own. There may be tabs that are present in the upstream repository that are not present at yours. There may be things that you can do as an owner of your own repository that you can't do as a visitor to somebody else's repository. So I recommend you spend a little bit of time and just kind of look at the interface. Take a look at what's behind some of the different tabs. Um, Try and get a sense for what types of things you might want to include in your own projects uh, if you decide to craft your own projects on here, etc. Um, take a look at some of the insights that you might get from who's doing what in the project and how many, for example, pull requests are currently active or what issues might be currently being worked, etc. Okay. Um, from there, let's talk about kind of the, the meat of the matter, which is submitting that pull request. You know, we made a change to a file, we want to get that pull request issued so that the owner of the project can consider it and make a decision about whether or not to bring it into their project. So I'm going to click on submitting a pull request. And you'll want to get that into the hands of the project leader uh, so that they can review it and hopefully incorporate your changes. To do this, you would navigate to your GitHub repository in your browser. Um, you'll find there is a conflict merge button available to you, or a, a branch button available to you. It's a drop down, and it will have a list of the various branches that might be present in, that, in your project. Uh, in this case, you should basically have main and you should have something called conflict merge. Once you click on conflict merge, um, the screen will change a little bit and it'll give you an indication of hey, this conflict merge branch is a couple of commits ahead of main. And off on the right hand side, you'll see that they have a link that allows you to issue a pull request. Click on that link, and then what happens will GitHub will confirm which changes in your repo that you want to share with the original author. Um, and so we can look down and see that uh, the base branch that we want to merge into is the author's, the original author's main branch. Um, our compare branch 
we can confirm that it is the conflict merge branch. Uh, GitHub will generally say that it is able to merge these two things. Uh, in some cases, you may get a flag that says it's unable to merge, but it generally will still let you make the pull request. There may be some changes that you just do not have the ability to resolve the conflicts, but you still want to get your info to the recipient or the, the project lead, and they can potentially resolve a few of the conflicts that maybe you weren't able to deal with. Um, so maybe you're making a, a change and somebody else has made a change and you don't know whether the project owner will want to keep yours or keep this other change that's present. Um, in which case you can then, you know, communicate to them that, hey, maybe you're sending them proof of concept or you're sending them some ideas for their consideration. From there, you'll want to fill in a title and you want to leave some comments, again, to explain to the, um, the project lead why you're sending them the request, the important parts of it, uh, how you think it's going to benefit them, etc. Um, and then you click the pull, Create Pull Request button. Once you do that, uh, GitHub is going to end up leaving you on the upstream GitHub repository. In my case, it would be Chalmer Lowe's repository, and you won't be on your own. Um, and so let's talk a little bit about what kind of happens here. You know, when we've got all of our changes in our origin repository and we issue this pull request, the word pull request is actually um, you know, a description of what's going to happen here. The upstream repository will be notified that you have content in your repository that you would like for them to take a look at. And so they can pull your content into their repository. Um, you can't essentially force them to take it. They have to agree to accept it. Right? And with that in mind, right, they are under no obligation to accept your suggestions. They could reject your suggestions outright. They could take their sweet old time in incorporating your changes. They could ask you to go back and make more revisions before they accept your changes. Or if everything goes really well, they might accept them immediately. Conversely, they may not do anything at all. Um, in the open source community, right, the project owner is in control of that project. And they have the ability to make decisions that they feel are in the best interest of the project. Um, so don't be surprised if sometimes things get accepted right away and sometimes things don't. If for whatever reason your changes don't seem to be appreciated by a particular project, that doesn't necessarily mean it's a reflection on you. Uh, feel free to either try and reach out and communicate directly to get some better understanding as to why your your changes might not have been incorporated, um, or you know if you can't come to an understanding, and the project owner decides that hey this is not the way they want to take the project, you know maybe this project is not a good fit and maybe your skills could be better used elsewhere. Um, a lot of this really depends on kind of good communication. If your pull request is incorporated, right, then the upstream repository gets copies of all of your files, and now anyone who uses that upstream repository can see your changes. Right. So with that, we want to move on to the next section, which is going to get into working with some real projects for how one can initiate a change um, manage those changes using Git and get your changes pushed up to your origin repository in GitHub and then issue a pull request to the upstream repository. Let's talk a little bit about how one might set up one's environment locally so that you can contribute to a real project, potentially a project with code and or user interface, etc, cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, as I noted at the beginning of this, there are two different lessons in here. One of them is related to uh, data science using Python and or other languages. It uses as a virtual environment manager uh, a tool called Conda. We do not yet have the Python project section finalized. Um, we are looking for folks who want to kind of help us clean a bit of that up. Um, a lot of it can basically mirror what's in the data science project, but use non-data science specific tools. Uh, maybe uh, like pipm, fiam, virtualenv, etc. But for now, uh, I will walk you through the data science lesson, 
we'll talk about a number of principles, et cetera, et cetera, and that will help you get set up and get ready for the types of activities that will likely happen as you're contributing to other projects. Because many projects nowadays use virtual environments of one sort or another um, to help kind of manage Python dependencies, et cetera. So with that in mind, um, we're just going to jump ahead to data science with Python and other languages. Okay. And it's going to be a little bit more focused on kind of data science types of Python programming environments. But a lot of the principles you're going to see here will be very applicable to just general Python environments. And if your project does use virtual environments to help with things like dependency management, um, your project lead will probably have a set of instructions on how to set up a, a development environment and what libraries and dependencies you will need. So they should hopefully be able to kind of take over from here and give you more detailed instructions on exactly how to set up your environment. But this should point you in the right direction and give you a sense of why you're doing what you're doing. Okay. So with that in mind, um, our main objectives here is to talk a little bit about what a virtual environment is, when using a virtual environment is a suitable solution to a task, how to create one of those environments, and then populate that virtual environment with some software necessary to complete your programming or development tasks. All right. Uh, the first thing we want to have you do is download and install Conda. And on this mini Conda quick start guide, uh, they have some instructions on how to download and how to install Conda. Uh, then you want to confirm that you've got it installed correctly. So we're going to do that. Mm -hmm. do, 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 do. All right. All right. Make sure I'm in the right folder. Okay. So Conda. Uh, if you have Conda installed, you can say Conda list, and it'll tell you what types of um, libraries might be installed in a current Conda environment. In this case, we see I have a bunch of different libraries that have been installed already. Um, I want to create a brand new environment. So I'm going to say Conda create, use hyphen n or tack n to tell it what name to give to the new virtual environment that I'm going to create. In this case, I'll call it my test. And I tell it that I want to use Python version 3, so Python equals 3. And it'll look for essentially the, the most recent version. Um, it may not be bleeding edge most recent, right? Because uh, the update process may take a, a, a bit of time, but um, this will get you pretty close. So it's going to start collecting some package metadata. It'll tell you what it wants to install. It's like, hey, I want to try and install Python version 3.9. Also, to be able to do this successfully, there's a variety of other new packages that need to be installed. And it asks me if I want to proceed, and I'm going to say yes. Okay. And so now it's going to download and extract those packages and try and install Python 3.9.4. That went fairly quickly. And now I can activate my environment and type conda activate my test. And notice on my machine, at least, uh, there is in parentheses an indicator to say that it is now using a conda environment called my test. Okay. If you're using Windows, there's a slightly different command that you want to use. If afterwards you realize, oh, there's some additional things I'd like to install, you can say something like conda install, um, and let's install IPython maybe, and let's install the mock library. And so say, hey, to install these things, I need to install a variety of other packages. Should I proceed? And it'll go about its business. Okay. So let's talk about what we just did and, and the why. So what is Miniconda, first of all, and why did we bother to install it? So Miniconda is a tool that has a package manager built into it. And the package manager is called Conda. Um, Conda is a package manager that is language agnostic. So you can use it to support um, program languages besides Python. 
you can install things like Julia and R and a variety of other languages um, using Conda. And it's part of why it's useful for data science projects because there's a number of data science libraries out there that are written in languages that are not Python. And so having a language agnostic uh, pro package manager can be very useful in cases like that. Um, besides being able to handle packages, Conda also allows you to create virtual environments to manage separate installations of Python. Um, and we'll talk about why that's important and what that really means. Uh, we'll start off by looking at kind of a fairly typical directory structure. Uh, notice we have a projects folder here, and then we have a couple of sub-projects called Space Game, Project Alpha, MyTest. When you create a virtual environment, Conda is going to add a subdirectory or a set of subdirectories to the mini Conda directory. And it will contain in that directory essentially a database and some metadata about your virtual environment. And it will include software and libraries that are related to your project. And so when I create a my test virtual environment, in the mini Conda folder under ENVs, there will be a my test folder. And <clears throat> when I create the my test virtual environment, inside the my test folder under miniconda ENVs, there will be a version installed of Python and a version installed of IPython and mock and all the other things that we installed. And so there's this kind of, I'm going to call it like a mental link between my test under my projects folder and my test under my M's folder. Um, the my test under the M's folder has all the software that I need to be able to run my project in my projects my test folder, right? Now, I want to emphasize that these two folders are different and they contain different things. One of them has an installation of Python and one of them has an installation of your code and your, your project sourceware, right? Now, you notice I have, in this case, two environments, one of them called Project Alpha and one of them called MyTest. Having different virtual environments in these separate folders allows us to do some interesting things. Each folder could have a very specific version of Python. Um, and for that version of Python, there might be different dependencies that, that version of Python requires. Like there might be different versions of SQLite for Python 2 versus Python 3, or version Python 3.1 versus 3.9. Um, and if I'm doing, say, a data science project or some sort of a, a web framework development project, you know, I might have other libraries that I need specifically for that project. And then some of those additional libraries might have their own dependencies that they rely upon. So if I'm installing NumPy, I might need libg Fortran or ML MKL. Um, and so you can see that, you know, under Project Alpha, I might have a wide variety of different libraries with different version numbers, and I can have in my test completely different version numbers. So I can have two separate development environments, and they won't conflict with each other, and they won't interfere with each other. And if I'm running the virtual environment for my test, I will know what version of Python I'm getting, which is 3.6, versus if I run Project Alpha, I'm getting Python 3.7. Okay. Now talk a little bit more about this idea of virtual environments. Um, sometimes you might hear people refer to them as virtual ENVs. There are these tools to keep your, uh, your project libraries and, and um, packages separated from each other, right? Um, they are not virtual machines. Virtual machines are a lot more clunky and intensive. These are very, very lightweight. It's a simple folder with a bunch of you know, files in it, which means you can easily create them and easily delete them. Um, people sometimes ask, you know, when should I use a virtual environment? If I'm just kind of playing around on my machine, can I get away with not using a virtual environment? And I highly recommend that, especially for new beginners, as soon as you start, you get into the habit of using virtual environments. Um, I often have a miscellaneous virtual environment for just playing around. That keeps all of my experimentation separate from maybe the Python version that's installed on my Mac. Um, and so that way I don't accidentally install stuff or change things that impact my Macintosh. 
and how it's running its Python scripts and programs. And then when I take on a new project, I create a new virtual env that is specific to that project so that I don't end up having some weird dependency issues that are hard to predict. Okay. We saw how to create a virtual environment. Uh, we saw some of the details about it and the activation process. Um, we saw how to add new packages. And you can always add multiple packages using conda install by just putting a, the name of the package separated by a space. There are alternatives to conda, and as we flesh out that additional lesson, um, we'll have more content related to that. But uh, pip is a Python package manager. It handles Python packages, but it won't handle other um, packages from other languages. Uh, there's vim, there's virtualm, there's pipm, and a variety of other tools that can be used to create and manage virtual environments. Um, discussing those is outside the scope of this particular lesson. If you want to know a little bit more about conda, or you want to know why somebody might use conda versus pip, there's an excellent discussion available for that. If you want to learn more about virtual env or vim, we do have some links to take you to that. And with that, that brings us to the end of the workshop. Thanks for attending the uh, Introduction to Sprinting Workshop. Uh, please join our Sprints channel on PyCon's Discord server so you can communicate with the Sprint leads and so that you can ask questions and or share some of your expertise with others who are helping to support the open source community. We're really glad to have you here. I'll be in the Discord server and you can ask me questions if you, if you feel the need. Uh, and good luck with your sprints. Thank you very much.